Hello, everybody. Uh, very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, this is my first time leading a devotion, so I pray that you'll be merciful with me. Amen. Can everyone just turn with me to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16? 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Now, about the collection for God's people, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Then, when I arrive, I will give letters of introduction to the men you approve and send them with your gift to Jerusalem. If it, if it seems advisable for me to go also, they will accompany me. After I go through Macedonia, I will come to you, for I will be going through Macedonia. Perhaps I will stay with you a while or even spend the winter so that you can help me on my journey wherever I go. I do not want to see you now and make only a passing visit. I hope to spend some time with you, if the Lord permits. But I will stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost because a great door for effective work has opened to me and there are many who oppose me. If Timothy comes, see to it that he has nothing to fear while he is with you for he is carrying on the work of the Lord just as I am. No one then should refuse to accept him. Send him on his way in peace so that he may return to me. I am expecting him along with the brothers. Now, about our brother Apollo, he is willing to go, but he will go when he has the opportunity. Be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be men of courage, be strong, do everything in love. You know that the household of Stephanas were the first converts in Achaia, and they have devoted themselves to the service of the saints. I urge you, brothers, to submit to such as these and to everyone who works, who joins in the work and labors at it. I was glad when Stephanas, Fortunatus, and Archaicus arrived because they have supplied what was lacking from you. For they refresh my spirit and yours also. Such men deserve recognition. The churches in the province of Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Priscilla greet you warmly in the Lord. So does the church that meets at their house. All the brothers here send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. I, Paul, Write this greeting in my own hand. If anyone does not love the Lord, a curse be on him. Come, O Lord. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love to all of you in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now, um, let me just set a bit uh, on the uh, context of this uh, writing. Uh. Uh, the the first Corinthian, right, is actually not the first letter that Paul wrote uh, to the Corinthians. It's actually, the second letter, and the second letter, uh, second Corinthians, is actually the third, fourth, and a bit of the fifth letter. Uh, but thank God, the the first letter, I mean, the second letter that you have in uh, First Corinthians is pretty whole, uh, if compared to Second Corinthians, which is like piece and pieces of what they can find. Now, uh. Corinthians, right, is uh, is very interesting because Corinthians, right, if we are to sum it up, <clears throat> what one Corinthians is all about is actually seeing every part of uh, life through the gospel. Because inside uh, Corinthians, you have uh, you have talks about division in the church. You know, remember in uh, chapter one to four, uh, it talks about who's more popular, Paul, Apollos, or Peter, when they came and visit the uh, Corinthians uh, church members. And then Paul's answer to them is that 
uh, you should have uh, unity, you know, uh, just as how Christ is. Uh, so everyone is, there's no one better or, or worse. So, and, and you realize Paul didn't feel like insecure that, oh, you know, uh, maybe Apollos is better or Peter is better. So these are kind of leadership that Paul was trying to exemplify. Uh, that we are all uh, same as we are all sent by Christ for different season to serve. Um, then after that, in five to seven, we talk about uh, sex. You know, uh, chapters five to seven talk about sex, and then uh, Paul motivated them for sexual integrity, so moral opinion lah. Of course, just to remind you, you know, there was some guy who was uh, having a relationship with his stepmother, and then he said it was okay, you know, kind of thing. So that's what happened in chapter five and seven lah. Then after that, you have a problem about food, things that you cannot eat that was offered to gods. Uh, <clears throat> now, the scenario here is uh, pretty, a lot of Christians, uh, a lot of us tend to debate this because we are not too sure whether can eat or cannot eat ultimately. Uh, the answer actually is can eat, but don't but eat in private. Because uh, at that time, Paul was saying that if you eat it in public, the food served uh, to the gods, then uh, the non-Christians might misunderstand to say that you worship a lot of other gods as well. So that wasn't a good testimony. Lah. So the core principle here is uh, to love others more than yourself. So don't just be too concerned about yourself, but be mindful about what your actions um, will, will result in. Lah. So that's chapters 8 to 10. Now, chapter 11 to 14 talks about the, the gathering. Uh, and how to have a meeting. And so Paul was quite creative in this part. Lah. He used the example, uh, like the body of Christ is just like our body lah, where there's a head, lah, there's a mouth, lah, there's a feet, lah, there's a hand, there's an eye. Uh, now, <laughs> this is simply to illustrate like what most uh, modern trainers like to do, lah, to use an example, or like Jesus would do, use a story or a parable. Lah. Uh, so, so now that concludes... Uh, uh, 11 chapters 11 14 now what's also interesting is uh, in chapter 15 talks about the resurrection of course we understand that the greeks the grecian mind don't really uh, believe in in the resurrection like like how we believe lah, to be resurrected fully now what is not shared is this yeah uh, a lot of a lot of time we hear this taken negatively that the greeks uh, don't agree with the the resurrection uh, of of Jesus, but 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 uh, if you did further studies on the social economy and the spread of the gospel during that time, right? Uh, during this time, uh, it was written between AD fifty to sixty. Uh, when Paul wrote this to them, uh, what they didn't realize was this: because the Greeks, right? They they believe they believe in resurrection because they believe that if you are resurrected. Uh, just like Achilles and a few other of their deity, right? They were resurrected together with in their stories. Huh? Uh, they believe that they were resurrected together with the body, with their body, like Jesus, and become immortal. So, so the interesting part is that now suddenly, you know, last time they thought that only the gods, or if you must do great things like Achilles, you know, greatest warrior or king or, or someone of achievement, then only you can have immortality. Uh, then they were introdu introduced to, to this part where Jesus uh, was offering us all uh, life in heaven, you know, and that we will be uh, resurrected because uh, uh, it is... It is the, the, that's why the Lord told us to that our bodies will be raised uh, from the dead, you know, in chapters 5 to 7. Uh, what you do, your body matters in the future when it's being raised. So what's so interesting is that every Greek, right, at that time wanted this immortality. So that's what spread the, the gospel. A lot of that accepted Christ during that time, which is, which is quite interesting. Uh, and then that really pushed the, the whole uh, uh, gospel really really far away lah. i mean really really far lah. uh now so just back to uh, a bit of uh, a geography to just show you where paul was uh, paul was at that time right in ephesus ephesus uh, is actually very far away you got to cross the sea you know to get to corinth corinth was in greek lah, uh, uh in greece sorry at that time so uh it was almost if not wrong uh 300 over kilometers uh, away so uh, pretty pretty far lah. uh in those times there's no aeroplane lah, so you can't get there in like half an hour so like travel by ship right <laughs> will take very very long lah. 
Uh, and of course, he said he cannot come yet because he had work to do in Ephesus. Uh, now, so what's so interesting is today my sharing is about, now I'll just summarize everything and my sharing today is about the final greeting. Uh, what's so interesting is if you go to seminary, I think one of the few lessons you learn about Paul, right, to study or to write a paper assignment about, right, is about the salutations of Paul. Uh, when I first got this, right, I was thinking, well, wow, how to write 25,000 words on salutation of Paul. All Paul did was, hi, grace, uh, greetings to you, grace of the Lord, you know, how to write 25,000 words on, 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 uh, on the salutation of Paul. Now, little did I know, right, that the salutation was actually quite important because when he opened up the statement, uh, opening statement, right, it, it, number one, it showed his, uh, his current state of mind, uh, why he say what he say and, 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 and uh and he explains about uh his current i mean where he is and things like that he he tend to be personal uh, with the with the his listeners uh, and then the the next the next part towards his final greeting right which is towards the end uh he sums up all that he has taught uh in his letter and the key lesson right the key to unlocking the message is in the is in the salutation so that's why after i realized wow Actually, can lah, can write, can write twenty five thousand words lah <laughs> on just the, the the salutations alone. Now, so uh, I know in the BWJ we are talking about giving. So since that part already very clear already uh, about the giving, I'm going to share with you the the back end part, the the twenty five thousand word part. You know where where it's not where it's not stated or or written lah. Okay, so. So I'm just going to, to, to talk a bit. Uh, now, although today's verse is uh, 13 to 14, but I'll start with uh, from 10. Uh, uh, start with uh, uh, Timothy. Now, Timothy, along with uh, Titus, uh, was one of Paul's special assistants, usually, you know, uh, sent to the most difficult places. Timothy had been brought up in a godly home in 2 Timothy 1, chapter 5. Um, but it was Paul who had led the young man to Christ. Now, Paul usually referred to him as uh, my own son in the faith. And when uh, John Mark abandoned Paul and returned to, to Jerusalem, it was Timothy who was called to work as Paul's assistant in Acts chapter 16. Timothy learned his uh, lessons well and made progress to, in Christian life and service. Uh, it says in Philippians 2, Eventually, Timothy took Paul's place in Ephesus. Very interesting, huh? Take his place in Ephesus. A most difficult place to minister. Now, it would not be easy for to be Paul's successor. Can you imagine? Paul, you know, the Jew of Jew. Uh, at one point, Timothy wanted to leave the city, but Paul encouraged him to stay. I can understand why the, the pressure and all to be Mr. Perfect. Uh, Mr. Paul, uh, Paul the Perfect. Now, the, the advice Paul gave the Corinthians about uh, about Timothy uh, would suggest that the young man had some physical and emotional problems, uh, just as in 1 Timothy 5 and 2 Timothy 1. He needed all the encouragement he could get. Uh, the important thing was that he was doing uh, God's work and laboring with God's servant. A church should not expect every servant of God to be an Apostle Paul. Now, young men starting out of service should have uh, great potential and the church should encourage them, let no man despise them. So what it's talking about is to allow him to be Timothy and not be a Paul. Now, the values are, are very clear in the Bible, but we all have different personality. Lah. So that's what uh, so it's talking about, to accept him, to embrace him and to encourage him. Uh, and okay, now 12 verses 12 to 14, it talks about Apollos. Now, Apollos was an eloquent Jew, lah, which is why a lot of them really like him. Lah. He has like a following, so like one of those modern day speakers today, like those Edmund Chan, like that. Uh, he was brought into full understanding of the gospel by Priscilla and Aquila. He had uh, ministered with uh, great power at Corinth, and there was a segment of the church there that felt attached to him. 
especially in 1 Corinthians 1, 12, 3, 4 to 8. It is unlikely that Apollos promoted this division, for his great concern seemed to be to preach Christ. In spite of the division, the Apollos fan club, fan club Paul did not hesitate to encourage Apollos to return to Corinth for further ministry. It is clear that there was no envy on Paul's part or sense of competition on the part of Apollos. Paul did not have the authority to place men against their will. Apollos did not feel he should go to Corinth at that time, and Paul had to concur with his decision. It is wonderful the way these different men work together. It's quite interesting because uh, how 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 the how the apostles and our leaders used to work together is not very much different from the the leaders today we all have our different opinions our thoughts and things like that and uh and how paul related to them is something very exemplary hence the twenty five thousand word here to talk about how we should uh, exemplify leadership and not force people to do things that they don't want to do lah. So perhaps it was in the light of this division in the church that Paul gave the admonitions in 1 Corinthians 16, 13 to 14. Now, watch simply what it means. Uh, be alert, be vigilant. The enemy is always at hand and we are never safe from attack. Satan would certainly attack the church and try to hinder the ministry of the apostles and like yourself, the disciples. Now, to stand fast in the faith means that you need to have a mature stability. Paul had already warned that we were immature children who needed to grow up in 1 Corinthians 3, 1. No wonder Paul added, quit you like men, which means act like men, not children. The word quit is short for acquit, which means to act. Lah. It was a call to courageous manliness at an hour uh, when mature leadership was needed. And of course, because most of my audience today are women, it's not just about manliness, it's also about mature womanhood. <laughs> All right. <laughs> now, when you read 1 Corinthians, it's it, it, it feels like it feels like that is uh it's very rebukish. It's like wow, so hard to to keep up to these standards, you know, the moral code and everything uh was there. And and I think there's a very strong Paul knew that there was a very strong tendency for the church members to start to accuse one another in a very uh not nice way, lah. Uh, you know, to feel holier than thou, better than you kind of thing. But but if you realize to to love another other than yourself is to think of other better than you. Uh so so the whole message can be summed up when you read in chapter 13 when it talks about uh, love is pure love is patient the whole verse there about about uh, love now the way that we need to to uphold these church standards is through the virtues and values of love now so i want to cite that uh, carl sandberg said shared that when addressing uh, the united states congress said that Abraham Lincoln was a man of velvet steel. Now, that's very interesting. Velvet and steel, that's a good image for, for Christians to, to ponder. Uh, steel, true manliness, but velvet, there, there's, it has tenderness in it. So, so velvet steel, you know. Uh, if there's nothing else to remember from this sharing, uh, remember velvet steel when when trying to rebuild a member or to teach or to 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 uphold a certain uh, law uh, in the church and so with that i just want to uh, end my my sharing thank you so much uh, for the time thank you for listening <laughs>